Welcome to Lessons That Last, where a researcher and a teacher talk about what it means to make a lasting impact on students' lives. They unpack the stories former students shared about their memorable teachers and discuss how we can all make a greater impact on the people in our lives. Here's Julie and Laura. Hello, and welcome back to the Lessons That Last podcast. I'm Julie Hassan, professor, researcher, and with me is my teacher, Bestie. Laura Estes Swilly, teacher and writer. And prepare for back to school. Yes, yes. So I'm ready. I th- I'm ready. Bring them on. You were born ready. And this is year what for you? Yes. Back to school. I, I don't know about zero year. I don't I, I don't understand the whole zero year thing. Just you could ballpark you know, it. So it's 24 or 25. <laughs> So about a quarter, about a quarter of a century, you've been Mm -hmm. back to schooling. Yes. Yes. Are you nervous? I'm nervous. And every year I say to myself, you are not a teenager. You don't need all new clothes. (laughs) 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 Um, You don't need a new school bag or like cute little notebooks and stuff like that. Um, But there's something about living in the cycle of a school year that yes. makes you think you do. It's a ritual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It would feel weird. It's like living in the South and not getting an Easter dress. I mean, right. even if you don't go to church in the South, you're Or getting, if you don't go out to dinner, it, people are coming over, you still have to have to get, an, yeah. get an Easter dress. It's like, well, you won't believe what kind of shoes I bought for back to school. I'm hoping they're Converse. Okay, can I tell you I tried Converse? They have no arch support. Oh, come oh, on, they're Converse. Awful. <laughs> they're awful. I mean, they're so cute. I love them and I want a hundred pairs, but with my um very delicate foot issues, I can't wear them. They just I mean, don't work. Converse teachers are on their feet all day. We need a teacher line with some yep. good yes. cushion and arch support. And I tried to put an arch support in it. And then they didn't fit. Mm. It, there just wasn't room for my foot and the insert. So I bought a pair of Doc Martens. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Well, keep your feet dry. Uh huh. And, and it's no storm. They have a <laughs> lot of like, um, I don't know. The sole is thick. Yes. So there's a lot of like shock recovery there. So we'll see. I still have to break them in because they're like super hard. Um, but I did get back to school shoes. That is true. Nice. I was in at the grocery and they had a little back to school display. And I haven't been a back to school elementary person for eight years now but I will admit I did smell the crayons did you I did and it brought back sweet memories I bet I bet the crayons are a very unique smell Mm -hmm. so I get that and actually I was just thinking I need to go to Target because their Crayola markers are a dollar and every year you need new markers and I need to get dollar markers yeah yeah So back to school, when we were planning to talk about this story, I had to talk to my husband because it's something a little different than what I experienced. So growing up, I always lived in the same town, Mm -hmm. went to different schools. So I went to Sefner Elementary, an elementary school, a little public school, loved Sefner. And then in sixth and seventh, our town was bus to Tampa, which is the urban place. Was the right. urban and place from our town? Bus. That's a long bus, especially in traffic. It was about an hour, mm-hmm. and logistically, because my mom was a teacher at the junior high, and the times she had to be at school and back, and the, it just logistically wouldn't work. They tried it with my older brother, you know, getting him to the bus stop and back. Like it, it, there was a lot there. So we ended up going to the private school that was very close to home for sixth and seventh grade. Yes. Which is where I met one teacher bestie, Laura Estes <laughs> Swilly. Um, and then we were back with our public school friends at the junior high and eighth and ninth. So although I went to different schools, I always knew people. 
<laughs> like there and were it's... always a group of people I knew everywhere. I, I was never the new kid in town, you know? Even when you came to Maddox, you you knew people. I knew. So our buddy Scott Overstreet yes. came with me. There mm-hmm. were a couple other kids from my elementary who probably had similar issues. Right. That the logistics of of going all that that way didn't work with their parents' schedules or whatever. Yeah. So coming in, plus because we were in the same town, there were a couple of kids I knew from dance or from right. my brother's little league. Right. Um, there were there were kids I knew at that school. Yeah. We talked last week about first days of school and how it I never really worried about it because at my elementary, I had the same class every year. It was almost like they could move the teachers because we were all going to the same room. So you had just one class per grade level. One class per grade. I knew who was going to be there. Every once in a while, someone moved in or someone moved out. But then when we got into sixth and seventh, it exploded and there were two classes. What? I know. <laughs> we doubled. So that makes sense that a lot of people you knew came because they had that same logistics issue. Yeah. Yep. So I had to talk to my husband because he grew up through elementary school in New Jersey. And in middle school, he came to South Florida, the Miami area, which is a huge culture difference. Yes. And went from a little place to a really big place and talked about just trying to adjust to that. He knew his cousins. So he had a couple cousins at the school. Oh, good. But that's two out of hundreds, yeah. you know? Um, and so trying to navigate being a new kid in a in a new state, in a very new place, and not, you know, they had all been together, right? So you are the new one. And yeah. I don't know what that feels like. And you went from that private school to junior high but still with people like you and I were there together people we knew right right did he did he mention if being an athlete helped to that transition at that point I th- I'm thinking in middle school probably not as helpful as it maybe would have been in high school yeah. you know middle school he's a baseball player so middle school probably not a baseball team in the sense where if you were coming into a high school baseball team you would have had summer practice and right and that might give you some relationships prior mm-hmm. to school starting that makes sense in this case i don't think so since mm-hmm. it was middle um but just a, a very different culture a very different town you know just the size of of the town even right and i think jason went through some similar things when he moved because he grew up here where we live now which is a very small little area and i can't imagine what it was like 45 years ago and he lived on a street that basically was populated by his family. It's named after his family. Everyone on the street at that time was his family. And so he got on a school bus with everyone, cousins, and their bus driver was one of the aunts. And so it was this really familiar, and I think they had a pack. It was like a a pack of little roughnecks, you know? A pack of swillies. A pack of swillies. And so that's what they did. And and if somebody gave one of them a hard time, they had all this backup standing right behind them. Um, And then he moved to Naples, Florida, which is um, further South and a totally different kind of town. Mm -hmm. Um, And he didn't have those cousins. He didn't have anybody. He had a sister Mm -hmm. and she was, you know, a little bit younger and he was, alone. And I think adrift, I think that that was a very difficult transition. It's almost, I know this isn't fair and he, he might not like this. He might balk at this, but I think of it like puppies, you know, when you have puppies and you take, Oh, I want a puppy. And you take that one puppy away from the litter and they mourn that litter and they need Mm -hmm. that litter. And it's hard adjustment for those puppies. I think that's what it was like for him just because he had that pack here. Yeah. I think, even as adults, like for me, I moved a few states away 
a few years ago, and even for me as an adult, you miss your friends and the familiar places and um, your family and the routine, and then you go to work in a new place and you're right. trying to figure out who's who and what's the culture here and what, where do I fit in and what part do I play and nobody knows you or even how to say your name. <laughs> Right. And I, I, I'm thinking about Brian in the, those terms, like that context, everything you just said, I was picturing him in landing in Miami with really n- his mom. And yes, there were these cousins, but they had a whole life before he got there. Right. How adrift he must have felt and how scary that must have been for Brian. How did you- Give him a hug. Little Give Brian. Hug. I know. <laughs> and I'm wondering too, if we think about gender identities, you know, is it different for us? You know, when I come to a new place, I think people tend to maybe assume that I need more support or guidance or uh, connection or nurturing. He comes across as so confident and, you know, he's tall and that, that you kind of wonder, it, does he not get the same sort of care and outreach at the beginning that maybe... That's a good I, point. I, I look a little more, you know, lost. <laughs> I am so glad that you're saying that, not just for me, but for, you know, for the thousands of people listening, the teachers who are getting ready to go back to school. Um, there's always someone new. And... Mm-hmm. I think we need to stop and look at, do we treat them differently based Mm -hmm. on gender? Because I bet we do. When you were saying that, I was like, I need to be aware of that. Um, I know what it's like to be a girl. So I'm going to treat a girl differently because I I feel like I get it. um, And I don't get what it's like to be a boy at all. Mm -hmm. But they need the same type of welcome and relationship building and nurture and just like answering of questions, we're all the same. Yeah. Um, so if you're a, a new kid, reminder. if you're a new kid, you're a new kid, right? Exactly. Exactly. And even Thank you. Like, we tend to, we do tend to worry about, I think the, the girls who are new and their anxiety and knowing they need a friend group, maybe more. Although I'm thinking about the movie Mean Girls. <laughs> Well, yeah. When yeah. Lynn, didn't Lynn, the Lindsay Lohan character come from like Africa? Her parents were researchers or something, and then they moved back, and she found herself in this high school trying to navigate the social right strata of that high school. So many movies are about trying to navigate being the new kid in town, aren't they? Yeah. Are they? Yeah, like think about Footloose as, as a new oh, kid. Oh yeah, no, okay, no. There's one with a, with someone who identifies as male. And that, yeah, yes. I hadn't so, thought about that. Kevin I, Bacon. I mean, who could not embrace Kevin Bacon? Although I'm thinking original Footloose, and I guess there's a newer one. Oh yeah, but that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there, honestly, I you know I don't watch a lot of movies, but I think that's a that's a movie theme that is timeless Hmm. because kids are always going to face that. And I always feel, especially for my students who are seniors, when you come in new as a senior, I just, I, and and not that my kids aren't friendly because actually I, I have really nice students and I just expect them to embrace the new kid. But what a hard time to move. What a hard time to change your whole system and um, not know where to turn for support. So Mm -hmm. I go way out of my way for Mm -hmm. a new kid as a senior. And in your school district, which is the same one where I used to work, there are so many military families. Yes. So you get kids who have had to practice being the new kid multiple times in k-12 and i'm i'm certain it never gets easy they must develop some strategies but yeah and and they do but i was thinking about a girl i had this year who moved in uh it was not in the beginning of the year it was maybe in the middle of first quarter Mm -hmm. she came from miami 
So um, the Miami culture is not, you know, Valrico, Florida, for sure. And they moved here. And then she stopped, like, I don't know, a couple weeks, stopped coming to school. Mm-hmm. And I said, where is she? And she came into my AP class. And so usually AP students are coming to school. They've got a heavy load. They can't miss. Um, and one of the girls said, I think they went back to Miami. They were very unhappy here. So right away, I knew that she had made connections because this young lady knew how unhappy they were, why they were unhappy and that they probably had gone back. But, um, I was like, wow, I I thought a lot about that family. Can you Mm -hmm. imagine you move here? There had to be a reason. And then it's so hard to adjust here after a month that then you uproot and go back there. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was, that was, uh, to me, kind of illuminating about some things. Right. And it does take time to mm-hmm. adjust to a new place. I think for me, somewhere halfway through last year, I finally started to feel like home. And that yeah. took it took a couple of years before it felt like normal. And I didn't like ache for home, you know, like I still met, you miss the places you love and the people you love and you always sort of carry that with you. But I think that was the first time where I really thought, okay, like this is my place too. Although we moved during COVID and that, you know, we had students who moved during COVID and that was kind of a unique situation especially so that probably if, slowed down your adjustment oh absolutely like I walked into the the college of education and it was an empty building mm-hmm. you know and it took me almost a year to meet my department chair in person yeah. and then you then all of a sudden you've got these new colleagues and you finally meet in person and all i could think was that person's so much taller <laughs> that's not what i was expecting <laughs> Because all you see is, you know, the right. chest up. So it was, an, and, and I'm sure places where they were, even if they were in person when they're in masks and you've got these new friends and colleagues and you only see mm-hmm. the top half of their face, right. you know? Right. So it's complicated the situation yeah. even more. I'm yeah. thinking about this story's elementary though. So I'm thinking about being a new kid in elementary and in some ways maybe that's easier because the day is more structured in that you're going to to lunch or to recess with your class you kind of have an assigned space to sit yes or not, this is our space to play right you're not left on your own to find a seat in the lunchroom or find mm-hmm. your bus at the end of the day I and mean, there's right. much more sort of supervision and mm-hmm. structure and teachers kind of making sure that kids aren't left out and that everybody is acclimated to yeah, all it's a routine. smaller environment it can be more governed Mm -hmm. and we talked in the last episode about all the fears that every kid has coming back to school am i going to like my teacher is my teacher going to like me am i going to learn things are we going to have fun am i going to add to that list am i going to make any friends yeah are they going to like me yeah am i going to be weird because i'm different because regionally everything changes Um, style and, and ways of speaking and even ways of learning. Um, So add to that long list that we already had about the first day of school coming from somewhere else, all of these new concerns. Mm. Yeah. Which leads us to this sweet story. Mm -hmm. And I think Miss Brentley, who taught fourth grade, who's just lovely, is this is probably a good practice for all of us, whether kids are new to our school or not. I know I did something like this as a second grade teacher, but I think it's something for us to to talk about how we can take this idea and use it. So, Laura, would you read Alyssa's story about Miss Brentley? Yes. My family moved across the country the summer before I started fourth grade. 
and I was anxious about attending a new school. I worried more and more as the start of school approached, but then a letter arrived in the mail from my teacher, Miss Brindley. The letter had a picture of my new teacher with her dog. She said she shared several facts about herself and the dog, and she seemed really nice. The letter also contained information about the classroom schedule, routines, and procedures. I read that letter over and over, and my anxiety began to turn into excitement. That sweet and simple gesture made a world of difference for me. Now I'm a teacher and I always send a welcome letter before the start of each school year. I include a picture of me with my dog, along with information about the class. Thanks to Ms. Brindley's example, when my students arrive, they seem a little less nervous. Sweet. I love so it. So now I'm wondering, how do you introduce yourself to your students? You know, this story makes me wish I could do something like this. Um, that's 180 letters, you know? Um, I've never done anything before yeah. school as far as reaching out to them. Yeah. But and they, they can't ac access like Canva or your platform no. before Not school, until starts. school starts. Oh, that's We too don't bad. even have necessarily our rosters until yeah. the day before school starts. Um, but we have open house and um, I like open house because I can talk to them individually and, um, and answer some of those questions that they're feeling nervous about that I, that they're not going to ask in front of everyone. I meet the parents. Um, I love having a freshman homeroom because there's, the, you know, everyone's like, oh, this is so big. And I can tell the parents, don't worry. Like I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to answer their questions. They're going to know where they're going. They're going to have someone looking out for them. I'm here. I got this. Um, and because the senior parents aren't worried, their their kids have been coming here forever. Mm -hmm. um, but it's those freshmen that are really nervous. And so I kind of, I don't teach freshmen and I've only taught freshmen maybe once or twice, but I do like having a homeroom of freshmen for that reason, because they, they need a little extra. And I feel like I am a little extra. <laughs> <laughs> so, so mostly yeah. for me, it's open house. I, I would agree. So how do you tell them about you as a person? Like not your grading scale or your expectations or your content, but how, I think students, because they're human and we're human, kind of want to know, okay, like who are you as a person? So I borrowed this from an icebreaker icebreaker no, that I actually, not an yes, ice no, you're gonna like it you're gonna okay. like it so it was actually something I made up um for uh pre-planning mm -hmm. and everyone received a name badge just like a hello my name is and instead of putting your name you put the name of your favorite teacher of all time Oh. And so as you moved around and spoke this to people, is Russell. you were hearing the stories of their favorite teachers. That is super sweet. Right. And I was like, why am I only doing this with teachers? I should be telling my students about my favorite teacher mm -hmm. because I realized as I talked to these teachers and heard about their favorites, that was connected to who I knew them to be. Yeah. And so I started telling my students about my favorite teacher in hopes that it would help them understand me, why I'm here, what inspired me to be here, and um, what I'm bringing to the table. And you can't tell people about your favorite teacher without talking a little bit about what kind of student and kid you were. Exactly. So it is pretty telling. Mm -hmm. It's an intimate conversation when yes. you start to talk about that yes. i love that idea thank you and and it's an icebreaker well but, but i i kind of leveraged that we can't talk about everyone's favorite teacher we just in a classroom we don't have time right that's, we don't have that's to the difference stand next to your desk and right. do a monologue about but for makes me, it a, a better icebreaker for introverts yes in some um, ways, yeah. And for me, as an introduction, I think that 
we've talked many times about Judy Bryant and how she shaped my life and, and me as a writer and me as a student. Um, I think if I'm telling you about her as my favorite teacher and what she taught me and why I wanted to become a teacher, now you know what kind of teacher I am. Yeah. So we're not going to call it an icebreaker. We're going to call it a con- connector. No, it's, it's not connector. a classroom icebreaker. It's a, it's a, it's a staff icebreaker. But it's a but, connector. Yes, big time. We're not okay, breaking we'll call any it a connector. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my campaign to banish the icebreaker. We'll so, call it a connector. Introverts unite against yes. against icebreakers that are not connectors that are not meaningful. Yes. Good uses of our time and connectors. You know, what's, what's funny to me is I teach grad students. They're all adults. They're all educators. But they still want to know things about their professor. So yes. I started, because mine can access Canva early, started a Google presentation of slides. All blank, but the first one, which is mine. And it has a picture of my family and my oh. dogs and my favorite book and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and so they know something about me. Yeah. I and like then, that. you know, first night of class, I'll unpack my slide a little bit. Then they will go and fill in their slides. Yes. And then every class, you know, a couple of them will just present their slide. Here's my slide. And I know so much more about them. And they do about me just from that. It's simple. It's quick. They know each other. They get to the good. And at any time they can access that slide deck. So if I say, okay, you're going to be working with this person on this project, they're like, oh, and they can go in. I love that. Uh, Yeah. It's it's super easy. It's fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always impressed with the amount of creativity, especially like my art teachers (laughs) will put into this slide, but you really feel like it shows something about the kind of their their priorities Mm -hmm. and their lives and what's important to them. That's great. That's great. I like that. I like, yeah, that wouldn't work for me just because they're going to meet me in person before they meet my canvas. Right. But um, you feel like with high schoolers and middle schoolers, same thing. um, They're going to seven classes Yeah, and they're meeting seven new teachers and they're trying to just get a handle on what, you know, which one is this one year, um, we had new staff shirts and our principal was like, everyone is going to wear your polo tomorrow on the first day of school mm-hmm. with khakis. And I was <sighs> like, I don't have, I don't have khakis. So I had to go out and buy a khaki skirt to wear my polo. Y'all are like target over there. Whole school. <laughs> And the kid said to me on the second day, oh, yesterday was so confusing (laughs) because everyone looked the same and I don't know who my teachers are or which person is which. And I was like, you're kidding. And and this was, I think it was creative writing. And one of the kids said, I remember you because of your voice. Okay. That's all I've got. I don't know who anyone else is because we all looked too all much alike. All teachers look alike. <laughs> yes. <Your> khakis. <laughs> our khakis and our navy blue polo. You're like Jake from State Farm. We all were. Of you. <laughs> we were. It was, it was funny. And I thought like, where did she come up with this? <laughs> but to see how it affected the kids was really interesting. That is interesting. Mm-hmm. And it shows you how much they're trying to figure out who we are and yes. differentiate who we are. And you do know a bit about people from what they wear, Absolutely. especially on a day like the first day of school. Yes. Like, you know, the math teacher and the old jeans and converse, or if you're Mr. Resiniti and you're a short sleeve Hawaiian shirt. Exactly. Or the Mrs. Barent. I'm thinking of all our high school oh. teachers. Mrs. Barentine, who always wore a suit. Her little, her suits. Her sweet. Oh. And she liked the blouse that would tie. With the bow. The blouse yes. with the bow and the suits. Mm-hmm. And she was not uptight. Like you might think hearing no. that. No. She was a little stuffy. She was the sweetest, easiest, she just was. the best. But you understood how much she felt like 
she was a professional and her work was a profession. Yes. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had some hippie teachers sure. who felt the same way about their work, just approached it differently. And you, mm-hmm. you just sort of knew something about them by the way they presented right. themselves. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about kids on the first day and what they're using to make assessments about who we are. Mm-hmm. So they can't say, oh, my English teacher was the one in the red shirt, <laughs> right? Or that was all of them. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, so it, I could only be distinguished by my voice, but that was probably only for the auditory kids. Right. If you were a visual person on that day, forget about it. You know, first day was a wash. Um, Except so- for you at times, and I know this because both of my kids had you for a teacher. Yes. At times wear some bright lipsticks. Yes. Which does tend to differentiate you from your Everyone. peers. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. I do love a good red lipstick. So, so there's yes. that. There's always, you know, you can always find some way to express individuality, even when your principal says you must wear the yeah. polo with the khakis. So I I definitely could see how after seeing that confusion, mm-hmm. how important it was to them to try to figure out who's who among their teachers. Yes. Yes. Which is very different. And that is certainly a big difference between high school and elementary. Yeah. So in this case, Sending them the letter, which I always did. They always got a welcome letter from me. Um, I don't know that I always thought to put a lot of personal. I put some personal information, but I love that she put a picture of her dog. Yes. Yes, me too. Me too. And I think I remember you sending those letters. Yes. I think I remember you doing letters Mm -hmm. um, for your second graders. Yeah. Every year. And I think in the same envelope, there was a letter for the student and a letter for your grownups, like whoever your grownups are, if they're parents or grandparents or fosters, you know, I would just put dear Alex's (laughs) grownups. I love that. I have a student or a former student who is a teacher and she teaches virtual Mm -hmm. and um, she sends so much mail to her kids. She sends them before school starts mail. She sends them, um, you know, I don't know, every other week they're getting a bookmark or an eraser or something because um, she, you know, there's a concern that doing online, you feel disconnected. So here's another way to connect. We're going back to connectors. Mm -hmm. Another way to connect is I'm, I'm not seeing you every day, giving you high fives. Um, but here's a high five through the mail. Oh, you know, I used to mail occasionally things, even when I had them in class face to face all the time, because there is nothing more exciting to a little kid uh, yeah. than getting a mail. So if they did something great, I just had little postcards, you know, that said you're a superstar or something mm-hmm. like that. But if they did something great, just to jot a quick postcard. And I think our principal was so sweet. He would give us stamps. <laughs> oh, that's great. And just drop it in the mail and oh, the excitement yeah. of, I got some mail from my teacher that said, I'm great. You know, sweet. I have, I have at times mailed thank you notes. So, um, especially at Christmas, they give me a gift, but then I don't see them. So I would mail it over break because I don't want them to feel like I just it took their gift and, you know, went home. Um, so I would mail that over break and they, and they enjoy getting mail too. the older ones because they don't, nobody gets mail anymore know, unless it's for a bill bills, right. Or a flyer. And so yes. they're really excited to get something that's sent to them. And then it's something, you know, grateful and kind and showing appreciation Personal. for you as a person. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Let's all make that something to aspire to this year. Let's drop a little something in the mail to our people. A little bit of mail. Yeah. I like that too. In the spirit of Miss Brindley, who found a way to connect, (laughs) not break the ice, connect, (laughs) connect, and put this little girl's 
fears at ease and tell kids something about herself as a person? I want to say one of the parts of this story that I love so much is that Alyssa read it over and over, Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't a one-time thing. And that's something that we forget. We do it. If we do something verbally, it's one time, but when we put it in writing, it's over and over as needed. Alyssa was able to pull that out and feel connected each time. That is so sweet. Yes. And maybe kind of sounds like it from this. Maybe she still has that letter. Oh, I bet. I bet. Oh, yeah. It gave me all the feels. I know. Probably such such a good story. I'm so glad you collected it. Probably a good time to end with me having all the misty eyed feels. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So teachers, we're wishing you a great start to a new school year. I know you will find so many brilliant ways to connect with kids. Maybe not break the ice with your colleagues, but, con- <laughs> <laughs> but connect with them as well. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Lessons That Last podcast. We're so happy you were here. Stay connected, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you will subscribe to the Lessons That Last podcast wherever you listen. Give us a rating too, which will help other listeners find us. And don't forget to visit chalkandchances.com for more stories. You can also find more information on Julie's research in books. While you're there, take the quiz to find out what kind of memorable teacher you are. I took it and was surprised by what I found. I think you'll find good food for thought. Let us know about your quiz results. We hope you will meet us here each week and bring a friend to share the conversation.